who are watching us on social media uh, and uh, Google Hangout and Zoom right now, they are going to have an opportunity to ask questions to which the panel members will respond to. We'll bring it back to the house here where you may get a second round of questions uh, to ventilate uh, subjects you're interested in and we will therefore close the, the press conference. Uh, I'd like to limit it to this particular story and not to any other you know, discussions on, on uh, proverbial matters of the elections or politics. Uh, this press conference is about this particular story which has met uh, all of our interests. At this point in time, I would like to welcome Dr. Sergei uh, to make his remarks and I'll be up again to introduce the panel members. Over to you, Dr. Sergei. Uh, in Kuth, but there are uh, provided a mic. Okay, excellent. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, colleagues of the media, uh, friends, and also the people online. I, I note that um, there's huge interest in today's media conference, uh, not just in South Africa, but also internationally. And I'm really delighted that we have the opportunity to uh, to be able to present to you uh, our findings. Is it better for me to start? Yes. Okay, that's even better. Okay, great. thank you. So, so we we are really delighted to be able to present you. Want to close those windows, perhaps? Uh, I know that maybe just the, yeah. We need the air though for the circulation, so it is a bit of a challenge. Firstly, my apologies for running a bit late. But um, these things do happen as we, we have a very eminent uh, uh, panel of experts that will join us in uh, providing additional information. I want to start off by saying that um, I instituted uh, a number of inquiries into the decuplets matter. And this was very important because independent media is the largest print media house in South Africa and has a very significant online presence. Uh, several million people in South Africa and several million others overseas have access to our news content. And it's important that we have a responsibility to them to ensure that uh, whatever we write, whatever we show, either in print or online, is in fact very accurate and that we can stand behind uh, those stories. I trust all of our 20 editors of our 20 titles. Um, that's the relationship that I have as the chairman owner of this group uh, with our ed editors. And um, the editor-in-chief who's also here today uh, is responsible for the editorial matters of the group, uh, Mr. Nisari. I think it's important to say up front that independent media is mainstream, but we're not mainstream. In a way, we go where others don't go. For example, we were the first to break the news of the CR17 bank statements. When that happened, it was labeled fake news. However, soon after that, we were able to produce the evidence of those bank statements, which are now seen. Secondly, we were the first to expose PPE corruption, which at this stage, according to the SIU, amounts to 35, uh, sorry, about 15 billion. Had it not been for independent media, I think probably at least three or four times that would have been stolen by those that are responsible uh, in, you know, in, in the sector. When we, when we announced the PPE corruption issue, for about two weeks, other media labeled that fake news until we were able to produce the evidence of that. And there are other cases, the Bushiri escape from South Africa, um, the warrant of arrest for a prominent politician that we were able to expose first, it was made to be fake. It was uh, proven to be in fact correct. 
I say this because we have no hesitation in speaking truth to power. We are not afraid to expose very powerful people, either in politics or business or in other spheres, that go contrary to the values that we expect and that are in our constitution. For that, we have uh, borne the brunt of uh, attacks and criticism. And this is no exception, absolutely no exception. I want to caveat what I'm going to say today, to say that the decuplet story, the story of the ten babies and the mother, the story, this is a story of the mother, primarily, is a sad story. It's a sordid story. And it is not a story, and it's not an outcome that we could have predicted. It is not something, when we started this investigation, it is not something that we thought we would, we would, maybe would end up. At the outset, when Peter Rampini, the editor of the Pretoria News, on, on Tuesday, the 8th of June, wrote the story of the mother, Sosiyami Satori, having given birth to 10 babies. This was a feel-good story. This was not an investigative story. This was based on the fact that Peter Ampedi had accompanied the mother on four separate occasions to private hospitals in and around Midran and Sampton. It was based on his engagement with the Zionist Christian Church as a church member. It was based on his engagement with the father and the mother. His story was based on information that was given to him uh, on the night of the delivery from the mother to the father and to others. Pitt wrote his story on that basis. Two days after the story was broken, the actually the next, uh, next day, the Wednesday, the Department of Social Development in Gauteng and the National Department of Social Development and the Office of the Mayor of Ekulene confirmed that indeed Osiyami Satoni had delivered 10 babies and that the babies were in a safe place or place of safety or safe place. That was a public statement and a statement on social media. The next day, there was a statement from GCIS, unusually from GCIS Pumla Williams, and also from the NC of Gauteng Health, and also from others, claiming that there was no such delivery of of these babies in either the private or public sector. This created what I can only describe as a media storm. And this called into question the integrity of Pete Rampedi's report. At that point in time, there was a lot of suggestion that this was fake news, not unlike what others had done on previous occasions when we reported. What we were surprised by is that the government, the government of South Africa, from national to provincial government, without investigation, was very quickly able to say that there were no such records. This was very surprising because you would have thought they would have investigated the matter first. And that was the first red flag that was there in this matter. As a result of the controversy, and in consultation with the Editor-in-Chief and other members of the Board of Independent Media, we said that we would do two things. Firstly, we would launch an independent inquiry by a highly respected advocate, a human rights advocate, advocate Michael Doman. And he would have access to all and Sunda that were involved in this matter, be it the journalist or others, including investigators, 
separately, independent media and its investigations team employed substantial resources to get to the bottom of this matter. No matter the outcome, it was very important for us to tell our readers and the public at large the truth, irrespective of the outcome. If there were no babies, we were prepared to say so. If the mother was never pregnant, we were prepared to say so. We were determined that the truth must prevail, and if there was to be a mere culpa on the side of independent media, then so be it, because sometimes mistakes are made. It is with that spirit that the brief was given to Advocate Michael Dover and to the investigations team. We removed Editor Pidram Pidi from the story completely. He was no longer involved in this matter, and the matter was dealt with exclusively by the editor-in-chief, the investigations editor, and other journalists and, and investigators from our group. As time went on, we discovered information which required even further investigation. I must add at the same time, our press ombudsman, Yoga Snare, also had a separate investigation. That investigation was early on and truth be told, the press ombudsman did not have access to the information that we have today. And that investigation of the press ombudsman and that report will be released as well, but it is a report early in this investigation. And it is separate from our report. Our press ombudsman operates as a completely separate entity and our editors and journalists and the company is subject to the rulings of our press ombudsman. I'm not going to comment much on the press ombudsman's report because Yoga Snare, the press ombudsman, has to do that. The inquiry of Michael Doman started, I think, about uh, August or was it in July? probably in July, and finished round about August, where the report was handled to us. I will comment further on Advocate Donan's inquiry. What Advocate Donan's inquiry did, however, say, it's imperative that independent media investigates further the suggestions that have come out of his report, which is what we took seriously, and where we decided to have further uh, investigators on, on this matter. I also want to tell you that we produced a 10 series video, series. I won't call it like a Netflix type of series, but let's say without budget, lo a low budget uh, 10 video series of what has happened to the mother and the decubits. This series will deal and provide details and names and documents and recordings, audio recordings, video recordings of all of those involved from the doctors, the hospital CEOs, the social workers, the politicians, the magistrates and police. Included in that series will be WhatsApp exchanges, WhatsApp messages exchanges, audio recordings, as I said, video recordings, substantial clinical records, and many, many other interesting developments. There are many here villains in the story from doctors, nurses, social workers, politicians, police, and others. There are also many heroes in the story, and heroines, that were brave, that put their life in danger, and continue to be in danger for having exposed what we are going to expose. Many of them have been threatened, Many of them were almost killed, but 
one of those heroines is sitting next to me, Dr. Paul Pook. When you take on powerful interests, whether they be in the health sector, government, politicians, business, you have to tread very carefully because these interests indeed are powerful. And it is in their interest to make it seem that what you publish is fake news, to discredit you, because ultimately they know where the culpability lies and eventually it would catch up with them. There were many that said we should leave the story of the decubits. Many within independence said that. Many outside of independence said that. But there was just something fundamentally wrong in this matter, in the story of this matter. And as a human rights activist myself, and as a doctor, as a medical doctor, having practiced for 10 years, something smelt rotten. And I thought it important that we investigate further, dig deeper, provide a protection to the journalists and others that slowly but surely uncovered the truth of what has taken place. I want to caveat this by saying our healthcare system and our healthcare professionals work against tremendous odds to provide good health care to our people in the public sector and private sector. The vast majority of doctors and nurses, social workers are honest people, good people, dedicated to good service in spite of the difficulties. The vast majority of police are good, dedicated to law, being law-abiding in this country. But unfortunately, there are always going to be a few rotten apples among us. <coughs> there are always going to be a few that abuse the system. The story of Vasyami Satoli is a story of a vulnerable black woman, poverty-stricken, whose vulnerability was taken advantage of by doctors, nurses, social workers, and others. We have a responsibility to tell the truth about what happened to her. We have a responsibility to tell the truth, even though she herself may be partially implicated in all of this. And the reason why we have to tell the truth is because her story is currently going on with hundreds of other vulnerable black women, in particular in state hospitals in South Africa today. Because as we speak right now, young women, black women, women that have fallen pregnant, that present themselves to state hospitals, are abused by a combination of nurses and doctors and social workers and others because of their poverty, because of their circumstances. Independent media is committed committed to exposing the complete right that exists in the system. We are committed to making sure that this government is held to account and has to clean up the system so that we protect our most vulnerable. The role of the media is not to protect the powerful. The role of the media is to protect those that are the most vulnerable and to expose those that are the most powerful, no matter if they are politicians, no matter if they are uh, police, no matter if they are prominent people in society. What the series will show you is the involvement through 
records, telephone records, messages, clinical records, audio records, video records of the involvement of very powerful people in all of this. So, I want to tell you what has happened to Hosiyami Sato and the mother, the mother of these decuplets, this vulnerable, poor black woman whose story is replicated hourly, every day, throughout South Africa and beyond South Africa. So what we have been able to establish unequivocally, without hesitation, I also want to tell you that we were threatened legally by the government on separate occasions, threatening brimstone and fire against us should we continue to publish the story of the decuplets. We were threatened that we would be summoned, we were threatened that they would sue us, we were threatened with all sorts of things repeatedly to prevent us from telling you the story. We ignored all of it. And in fact, we invited him to summon us. Because as the weeks went by, more and more pieces of the puzzle were beginning to um, fit into place. We invited them to comment at all times. At the beginning, they were quite verbose and made all sorts of statements publicly and everywhere. In the end, they were completely silent and refused to respond to our emails, WhatsApp messages of our journalists and others asking for comment. Suddenly they were silent. They knew, as we knew, that we are on the verge of exposing them. As to the doctors involved, some of them have fled. We know that. They're not in the country, but it's fine. They will be exposed in the series, and I'm sure action will be taken against them. So, what happened to Maria Sato? So, she was pregnant. She was diagnosed at Steve Biko Academic Hospital round about December 2020 with six babies in the first camp. Subsequent to that, she was taken round about January, February to Sunning Hill Hospital where a second scan was done and she was introduced to a sponsor doctor who said to her that he would make sure that she delivers in a private hospital. The doctor by the name of Roberto, which we'll come back to later. The, the doctor that you saw is known to us, who operates on two names, including a pseudonym. His name will be revealed in the series. All I can tell you, he's a Nigerian doctor. At Sunningham Hospital, the scans showed there were eight babies. After that, Mr. Toli went about 40 times, I think it was. We have the dates and the times that you visited Steve Biko Hospital every Thursday. She visited the following private hospitals every Tuesday, every week. The hospitals are Sunny Hill Hospital, Kasterhof Hospital, Arvrek Hospital, and one visit to Medford Hospital. All of these hospitals is in the capital city, Tsani or Pretoria, except for Sunning Hill and Kasterhof that are in Midrand. The others, Steve Biko, Louis Pasteur, are in Pretoria. Medford is in Pretoria. In fact, on one occasion, the lead doctor that delivered her babies took her to show her eight baby pregnancy to four different 
um, hospitals to showcase her as, a, as an example of multiple pregnancy to his colleagues, showing off the scans, showing off uh, uh, a whole lot of other things about the pregnancy. At all times she was told that because of the fact that she had eight babies at the time, according to the scans, she would deliver in a private hospital and that they encouraged her to give the babies up for adoption and that the full payment or the full cost of her delivery in a private hospital would be paid for by these doctors provided that she gave the babies up for according to them adoption we know all of the doctors involved every single time she went to visit them at each of these hospitals round about the sunday the 6th of june 2021 after having had about 40 visits to steve biko and his private hospitals on a weekly basis i must add as the pregnancy grew, Mr. Tony found it very difficult to get into a taxi because the taxi drivers complained that she took up too much of the seats because she was too big. And on some occasions, Peter Ampidi took her himself in his car to four of the to, on four occasions to the private hospitals. On three occasions, he waited for her to have the uh, examination. On the one occasion, he came back after two hours to fetch her. That is how close he was to Miss Satoni. She had great difficulty in walking, great difficulty in standing, due to the excessive pressure that the, the large uh, abdomen and the womb was putting on her legs and other parts lower down. In the end, Mr. Tony was booked off on the 3rd of February to when she saw a private practitioner of work. We have a copy of that certificate showing multiple pregnancy. That will also be revealed in the Netflix series. In our series, not the Netflix series. Sorry. Um, Subsequent to that, on Monday, the 7th of June, she had contacted the doctor who was known to her by a pseudonym, not by his real name. Subsequently, we were able to track him down because that's the name he uses with his patients. The Nigerian doctor. In his practice, he has two names. If you're a patient, you see his Sudan in his practice. We have a video recording of that. On the 7th of June, she contacted him and said she was having some abdominal pains. We have recording of the contacts between the doctors, the obstetricians, at the private hospitals, Steve Beaker hospitals, the paediatricians at Steve Biko, George Macari Hospital, and Tembisa Hospital. We have actual recordings between the mother, actual phone recordings, what do you call it, uh, summaries of the phone, phone contacts between all of them, establishing the direct contact between all of them, especially in the week of the 7th to the 10th of June. With panic setting. On the 7th of June, she went to Steve Beaker Academic Hospital at around about 4.30. We have photographs of her at Steve Beaker Maternity Ward on that day, the 7th of June. These will be presented in the video series as well. 
Her telephone location puts her at Steve Beaker, except for the time period 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. where her phone was off. And I'll tell you why that's important in a second. But from Monday, 4.30 p.m., right through when her phone gets switched on again, to Wednesday, Mr. Tony is at Steve, a location of a call, places her at Steve Beaker Academic Hospital. These location devices don't lie. They tell you where you are, no matter what anyone says. At 6 p.m., she was induced by this doctor. In other words, for some strange reason, which you don't normally do in a multiple pregnancy, she was given the prostaglandulin tablets inserted into the vagina to induce the pregnancy. I have my own suspicions as to why that was done. Something happened at Steve Biko Academic Hospital that evening. Mr. Tony then, with the doctor, was taken to another doctor at the private hospital in Tembisa. We have been able to establish that that is Sama Kushle Hospital. It appears that at Sama Kushle Hospital, and this is where it gets a bit gray, she had a caesarean section. They tried to do a normal vaginal delivery, but she had a caesarean section. Something went wrong, horribly wrong. She was transported in pain by ambulance from Zama Kushle Hospital across to Tembisa Hospital. She was in great pain according to the clerks working at Tembisa Hospital. What happened at Tembisa Hospital could only be described as a tragic comedy of errors. There were no incubators for these babies. What these doctors discovered was that indeed there were eight babies in the womb, but two babies were sitting in the fallopian tube that they had missed. They had to go back and remove the two babies. Two of the babies died on delivery of the ten babies. Mr. Tony delivered ten babies. Due to the negligence and incompetence of what had taken place by these doctors and nurses, Two of the babies died. The fact that there were no incubators is really tragic. What then happened, according to multiple sources of ours, at these hospitals that I've just mentioned, was that there was huge panic about the babies. They were then transported by two ambulances with the mother, who was in great pain, a great risk to these babies that were now preterm at 26 to 28 weeks. 28 weeks. They were a great risk to them. They were transported to Steve Beaker Academic Hospital. According to our sources at these hospitals, it was done with a phone call between the acting CEO of Tembisa Hospital and the CEO of Steve Beaker Academic Hospital. Dr. Matabu, who made arrangements for the babies to come to Steve Beaker ICU, the eight babies that were still alive. When they arrived at the Steve Beaker ICU, according to health professionals at Steve Beaker, they never had enough space, neither enough incubators. Frantic phone calls were made to various hospitals, including to Professor Dini Mawela, at George Macari Hospital to provide incubators and for the babies to come over to George Macari Hospital. The CEO of Tembisa Hospital was subsequently promoted. He was at that time acting. The CEO of Steve Beaker Hospital went public to claim that when the mother arrived there on Thursday from and I'll come back to that from the lodges section at Steve Beaker. And she went to look for her babies. The CEO of Steve Beaker claimed, she claimed that the mother was delusional. 
and the mother was there to come and find the babies. It was she who claimed that I want to make this call. When she was fully aware that the babies were at Steve Biko Academic Hospital ICU in April. The mother saw the babies on a Tuesday or Wednesday, on two mornings, either Tuesday or Wednesday or Wednesday and Thursday. She was then told by a pediatrician from Steve Biko Academic Hospital that her babies are fine and they are taken to a place of safety, which they meant George Mackay Hospital, and that she will be taken to see them on Friday morning. However, at the same time, because of the controversy that was now in the media, this created panic from hospital administrators and government officials. They were panicking because there was something much more deeper and sinister going on. It was not expected that Peter Rampidi would write the story, because this was a feel-good story about the 10 babies in the world record. They didn't anticipate that story. And that story led to what happened next. The mother, when she was taken to Steve Biko on early hours of Tuesday morning, woke up at Steve Biko Academic Hospital. The mother was drugged from Monday evening, 6 p.m. till the next morning. She did not know that she had even left Steve Biko Academic Hospital. She thought all the time she had delivered, she had been admitted and delivered at Steve Biko Academic Hospital. She was not aware that during that four hours between 6 p.m. and 12 p.m., she had in fact been taken to Zama Kushle and then to Lisa back to Steve Biko. She was told all of the babies were fine. She was not aware that two of the babies had died. She was not aware of that. She went to see the babies, the nurses, and she gives the names of the nurses at Steve Beaker that took her to see the babies in the ICU. She describes the babies as very tiny and not looking like babies, which is exactly what one would expect when you had a womb or 10 babies um, and you were at uh, 28 weeks of gestation. Exactly. She describes it exactly. She describes the epidural, what happened to her, in great detail, that very few, unless you were a medical person, you would not be able to describe the color of the tablets, the size of the tablets, what she was given to drink, what it tasted like, every bit of detail the mother was able to provide that information. And it was subsequently corroborated by a couple of matrons, a couple of nursing sisters, all of whom were told, should they disclose any of this, they were forced to sign um, non-disclosure agreements. They will never ever work again in the public sector or the private sector. Some of them were told that their license, the registration with the Health Service Professional Council would be revoked. Should they even think of disclosing what happened at these hospitals? It was quite interesting because within the two-week period when the controversy started and we sent in an investigation team, we actually had the doctor from the beginning, but we kind of lost him because he used the pseudonym. When he was confronted by two of our investigators, he in fact said, this is, I'm quoting what he said. He said, look, I was not responsible for delivering the babies with this mother and for the mess. I was called in to clean up the mess. It was the other doctors that were responsible for this. I'm quoting him. The only problem was that he used the pseudonym, which we finally tracked down to him. So we're looking for the wrong doctor all the time in, in, in a way, because the mother kept on saying what the doctor's name was, and we couldn't find this doctor anyway until we realized that the lead doctor that did all of this is the same doctor that carries the pseudonym. The mother stayed at Steve Biko's lodger's house, a lodger's section, which is right opposite 
in the same academic complex as Steve Beaker. So here is the hospital where the maternity ward is. The mother describes ward, I think it is, I may be <coughs> open to correction, 8.8a 8, 8, 8. 8. 8 and then 8.3, I think, 8.3b. 8. Very accurately. Describes exactly where she was. Opposite that is the largest section, also I think called Swani, so Swani District. District Hospital, where she was then put for the next couple of days. So you, you normally go there once you've delivered uh, to that larger section. We have photographs, we have everyone confirming from security guards to nurses that the mother was indeed there at Swani Hospital, which is part of Steve Beaker Academic Hospital. The mother subsequently uh, left on Saturday the lodges section. She tried to go back to Steve Beaker to see her babies and was shocked when she arrived there and asked them to take her to the ICU to see her babies and they said no, that there are no babies here. So suddenly Steve Beaker started panicking. Then she got a phone call from the doctor. We have a recording. We have, we, we have the phone records on that Friday to say he was going to take her to see the babies at the place of safety. She didn't know at the time, but we know he was referring to George Macaulay Hospital. He panicked because at the same time, the father's family had opened up the missing persons um, report for the mother, claiming the mother was missing. And so the police were now looking for this mother that was missing. And so he decided not to, to take the mother that morning to wherever the babies were. This is the lead Nigerian doctor. At the center of this birth, and at the center of hundreds of other similar cases operating in Gauteng and Pumalanga. Subsequent to that, the mother uh, gave a number of video interviews and all sorts of things. And there was a bit of a tiff between the mother and the father relating to the father's, let's just call it, uh, wife. Although the mother and the father of the decretlets were in fact married by, uh, what's it, uh, traditional men. They, they, they were married. After all of that happened, after all of that happened, there was a missing case against the mother, and the mother was then fetched from her place of residence where she had stayed by the police. And the most crazy things happened. They came to arrest her because she's missing. And she was taken to Chlorquip police station in Tembisa. At Klorkov police station in Tembisa, the mother, the mother called her a lawyer who came there. When the lawyer confronted the police and said, what's happening because she's not missing, she's here in front of you. They said, no, they were on the instructions to detain the mother until social social work, the social department arrives. Anyway, a short while later, a social worker who is very interesting, whose name will be revealed in the series, arrives and speaks to the mother and says to her, look, we have taken your two twins away from where they were because the twins were staying with the father's family, the father's mother. They were six years of age. We've taken them away. We want you to come with us to come and see them, if you want to see them. The mother said, yes, I'll go with you, provided that the lawyer can accompany me. They said, no, we want you to come. We know that you are very, because of all the media attention, you're suicidal. The mother said, I'm not suicidal. I'm perfectly normal. I don't know what you're talking about. The social worker insisted the mother was suicidal. The mother insisted that she's not. In any event, the next thing 
The police were informed they must detain the mother in the back of the car, which they did. An hour later, two attorneys from the state attorney's office arrive. Uh, they speak to the mother and say they are invoking the Mental Health Act because the mother is suicidal. They are taking the mother to Tempisa Hospital for observation. The lawyer objects to this on what grounds. This is not what the Mental Health Act says. The mother writes a note saying to the lawyer, please, I'm not mad. I don't know what's going on. Please help me. In any event, the police prevent the lawyer from intervening. And the mother is now taken to Tembisa Hospital and interned at Tembisa Hospital under the Mental Health Act. Now, if you know anything about the Mental Health Act, as Advocate Doden will tell you, what they did was not just illegal. It's criminal. It's criminal. You cannot detain someone without a family member, without the person being at risk. And there's various forms which have to be filled in. None of that happened. The very same social worker who's at the center of all of these things was the one that filled in his forms. The mother was then detained under police guard, unusually at Tembisa Hospital. She was told at Tembisa Hospital she's not to speak about the pregnancy or whatever happened to her. She'll be out of Tembisa Hospital by Monday morning. What happened subsequently is that some psychiatrists, according to the clinical records, were told to come and examine the mother. These psychiatrists at Tembisa Hospital wrote that based on conversations with Steve Biko, academic hospital obstetricians and head of department, the mother was not pregnant because she didn't deliver pregnant. They said that the mother, um, according to Steve Biko, there was no such delivery. So based on that, the psychiatrist, not examining the mother, make a determination that the mother is schizophrenic and that she never had delusion, without any examination. But in fact, when we look at the clinical records of the mother, and an obstetrician does see the mother, what does he say? He doesn't say the mother is not pregnant. In fact, he says, multiple pregnancy, question mark. That's what he says, because he's too shit scared to say she's not pregnant, because he loses license. That obstetrician is known to us. All these doctors that are responsible for this should have their license revoked, all of them, for having taken an innocent, vulnerable black woman that had just given birth, denied her the right to see her babies, and then subsequently wrote a report that she was schizophrenic and against the wall, and we have an audio recording of this, the mother screaming for help as she was taken into the car to West Coppy Psychiatric Institution. The aim of the health officials, the CEO of Tendisa Hospital, the CEO of Steve Beagle Academic Hospital, and others, we have it very reliably that the MEC of Health in Gauteng MEC Mocheti was there at Tembisa Hospital the day after the mother was there. All of them tried to get the mother incarcerated at West Coffee Psychiatric Institution for probably a year or two, hoping that the mother would commit suicide, hoping that the mother who had just delivered was now, you know, sort of becoming very depressed by what was happening to her. All of these people are culpable and should be held responsible and have their licenses revoked. All of them. The mother was told repeatedly at West Coppice Hospital, if you 
say you never had the babies, if you say that you were never pregnant, then what we will do is release you. But if you ever say you were pregnant, you'll be here forever. You will never leave West Coffee's Hospital. One of the heroines in the story is an attorney by the name of Refilu McQuenna, an activist for women's rights, as is Dr. Mpuri, Dr. Mpuri here next to me. An activist against GBV. It is ironic that this government speaks about GBV when in fact it acts very differently when it comes to vulnerable black women. She decided to take up the case of this mother and she went to the Mental Health Review Board and I must give credit to them. At least something works in the system. The Mental Health Review Board had a year at which she managed to get the mother released. But the mother was told by West Coffee's Hospital, she must say she was never pregnant and she never delivered in order to get her out. She was eventually released under the care of a lawyer. That gave us the opportunity to do two things. With the mother's consent, to invite a private practitioner independent private practitioner, an experienced obstetrics and gynecological practitioner to examine the mother because Tembisa claimed that they'd examined her. In fact, the Secretary General of a prominent media organization went public and claimed she had a source at Tembisa which said that the mother was never pregnant. That Secretary General should be held to account for putting such disinformation in the media space. I will not mention the organization, but it's disgraceful that that woman, who is a Secretary General, could be part of the propaganda war against an innocent black mother. Because there was no such source, it's complete rubbish. It's all propaganda to make it seem like this mother was never pregnant. As a result of all of that, the independent practitioner found unequivocally, and she'll give you more details, that the mother was indeed recently pregnant, had a recent cesarean section, and she'll provide other details when she speaks. Subsequent to that, subsequent to that, we launched further investigations into the conduct of these doctors, the nurses, <coughs> hospital administrators, including accessing through sources, in some cases, the bank accounts. What we discovered was really devastating, really devastating. What we discovered, which will be presented in our video series in great detail, great detail, is that our state hospitals are the epicenter of human trafficking and baby trafficking. We can say unequivocally, this happens at Steve Beaker Academic Hospital, Tembisa Academic Hospital, Tembisa Hospital, and George McCarley Hospital. We can tell you unequivocally that involved in this home affairs, multiple IDs, records of patients that don't exist or disappear, babies that come in, if mothers deliver twins, they're told the one twin died and the other one is trafficked. Or if they're very young, vulnerable black women, they are told that they, their babies have died during delivery and the babies are trafficked. We were able to a great risk to our journalists, deep dive into the syndicates and uncover horrific, horrific stories of how these babies are trafficked from Gauteng through to Pumalanka, through to West Africa 
and also to Europe and the United States. About 50% of the babies are given for adoption. The other 50% are used for muti, cosmetic surgery and stem cells. In some cases, the placentas are used for uh, cosmetic and, and other stem cells. This has been a very, very dangerous investigation. It has put at risk our journalists and our investigators. In fact, many of them have been stopped by none other than police <laughs> and threatened to, to back off. Many of them who visited the doctors within 10 minutes of them being there. 10 minutes later, police cars arrived. What we are saying to our government, it's okay to make mistakes. It's not okay to come up. Admit to your failures. We ask you, we beseech you, in the interest of our people, in the interest of the poor, vulnerable black women, to put systems in place to prevent what has happened to Maria Satori, to prevent human trafficking and baby trafficking. We ask you to suspend immediately the hospital CEOs of all of these hospitals. We ask you to suspend the MEC of Health and Caltech, the MEC for Social Development. We ask you to look into the National Department of Health and indeed even higher up in the government. We as a country have to accept that we are not perfect, but we cannot be an epicenter for human trafficking, baby trafficking. Inequality, poverty is rampant in our communities, but that does not mean that those that are powerful, those that are, have been given responsibility, medical responsibility to look after people, the poor in particular, can abuse those positions of power to benefit financially. According to our sources, the baby trafficking industry is worth between one to two billion rand annually in South Africa. That is the size of the baby trafficking industry. Entire networks exist of babies being trafficked from Gauteng, Soweto. We even have the names of all the surgeries where they operate from. We have the names of the doctors and we also have the name of the key person that organized the syndicate. Well, the syndicate that we know, there may well be other syndicates. We've only uncovered this in a few hospitals ourselves because we've had to focus our investigations team on those hospitals. We have no doubt that they are operating in other hospitals and possibly in other provinces as well. It is extremely sad if you're a parent and you lose your child, even if it's your baby, even if it's a baby. The loss of a baby and your child. I want you sitting here in front of me and those out there to imagine what it's like to carry a child for nine months and have that child taken away from you and traffic on them. I want you to imagine that. This is what we are dealing with. And just because you're poor, and sometimes you're complicit, sometimes you accept the money because you are told differently. You are told that your child will end up having a good home, will be adopted, whatever. And so you accept money in exchange for that. But ultimately, you're a victim. You're a victim because you're in vulnerable circumstances. Whatever our government says about GBV is completely hollow if they do not act on this matter. Institute a commission of inquiry. In fact, get law enforcement authorities to investigate each and every single one of the doctors, nurses, social workers, police that are involved in all of this. We offered early on to provide the government with all of our information. They still haven't contacted us. In fact, we can tell you that the one policeman that they used to actually conduct this investigation has sat 
on the docket and does absolutely nothing. Every time he goes, they go higher up, it is, it is said they must stop investigating. We can say this unequivocally, without fear of pain. We have done our homework, and it is tragic. This is not what we expected to find. If we had expected to find there were no babies, the mother never delivered, that was okay. We make mistakes in journalism, and we have to accept that. But that's not what we found. On the contrary, we found the opposite. I want to make a final point on journalism. Journalists are not perfect. Journalists make mistakes. But sometimes we have to learn from those mistakes. It is true that this was not an investigation speech when Pitt Rampedi wrote it. It was a feel-good story based on the information that he had on hand. But there are certain journalistic principles that I think could have been done better in certain journalistic ways. And our press ombudsman's report says that. And so does Advocate Dolan's report. And we will take to hand that we need to improve in those areas as a media organization that is accountable to our readers and audience and the general public out there. It's important that whatever we do, we verify and we follow proper systems and procedures. There are lessons for us as a media organization. And the editor-in-chief and his colleagues will implement those lessons. And we are thankful for being given that opportunity. As regards Mr. Rampedi, the editor of the Pretoria News, he accepts that he made some mistakes. He apologized to his colleagues. But those mistakes were not about the existence of the pregnancy and the ten babies. Those mistakes were about having brought them too close to the mother and the church. And, um, and sometimes you need distance as a journalist, as you do as a doctor. As much as you may love your patients, it's always good to have a bit of distance in order to have objectivity. Nonetheless, we take on board some of those lessons as independent media. And Peter Alpedi himself has taken some of those lessons on board. We live at a terrible time for media and journalism in our country. The powerful politicians want to shut down media, shut down those that don't agree with us. Independent media has been a target because we've not been afraid to highlight, as you will become aware, over the next few months, independent media will expose powerful, powerful politicians and businessmen involved. We expose the PPE corruption. I'm telling you now that the stories that our journalists are working on that will come to light in the not too distant future are going to shock the foundations of this country. Those in power know exactly what we are busy working on and therefore they would love to shut down this media house. They would love not to have exposed, like we did with PPE corruption, had we not exposed it, I can assure you, that corruption would not just be 12 to 15 billion. It would have been closer to 60 billion. And the poor doctors and nurses and patients, in particular in our public health care sector, would have suffered without having access to all of those PPE. Our role as the media is to expose these things. Our series we are going to publish over the next 12 weeks a video series, a documentary, 15 minutes each, identifying each of the individuals, the doctors, the nurses, the hospitals, the social workers, the police, the government officials, the politicians, all at the center of all of this. We'll not just put it on video, it will also be printed in independent media publications as well as 
online, print and online publications. We'll provide in that series all clinical records, all WhatsApp messages, exchanges, all audio recordings, all video recordings, um, and, and similar information that um, supports everything that we've just told you. This has been a very difficult time for my colleagues, but I want to thank, thank them for persevering. I want to thank them for standing up for what's right and for standing up for this poor, poor vulnerable mother. But most importantly, for us, it's about protecting all the other vulnerable women in our society that are victims of these very powerful syndicates. You'll also hear from us in the video series of how a nurse that took the photographs of the babies had a phone smashed by the hospital manager and was suspended, remains suspended today. Perhaps the nurse should take up the case of that nursing system. You also hear the story of how she was threatened by the syndicate. But there are too many people that know too much. And that's why the syndicate can operate and threaten our journalists, our investigators. But we are not afraid of them. We stand for the truth and we'll publish the truth. We're not afraid of anybody. Because at the end of the day, we are there to defend the most vulnerable in our society. I hope I've given you some inkling of what has happened here. You'd have to watch the series. You'd have to read the series in print and online to get the full details of each and every person involved. We're not going to hesitate in publishing their names. I can tell you that. But I will not do so today because it's a lot of information. So with that, I want to say uh, thank you to everyone involved. We'll continue to investigate. This is not the end of the investigation. We've widened our investigation to look at other syndicates operating, not just the ones that we've been able to reveal and discover. And we'll continue to, to publish that information. The government has to answer one question to all of us. Where are the babies right now? Where are they? Well, let me put it differently. What has happened to them right now? They were shunted sometimes in the cold of the night between Steve Biko and George Macari and at George Macari itself to hide them. The government must take responsibility for not having incubators and for shunting preterm babies in the cold if something happened to them. We know, for instance, two of the babies were intubated by the pediatrician, and we know the pediatrician, in the wrong tube because they didn't have the right size tube in the wrong, the tube went in the wrong direction. We know that. That is medical negligence. They should not have had four doctors at the delivery of the mother. They should have had 25 doctors and nurses. They should have had at least 12 incubators ready. They should have done all of the things that is required of a pregnancy like this. Even if they didn't know it was 10, even if they thought it was 8. There is no excuse for this kind of medical negligence and cover-up. None whatsoever. They must all be held accountable. We will not raise this independent media until everybody, from the nurses to the doctors, to the hospital CEOs and administrators, to the politicians, are held accountable for what has taken place. We have to stop baby trafficking and human syndication. That will become a major theme of independent media for the next 12 months. All of our titles are going to carry 
stories about human tra trafficking and baby trafficking so we can stop it. We can make the public aware of what is taking place. Human rights organizations, GBV groups, we invite all of them to come and join us in this fight against baby trafficking and human trafficking. With that, I will now, <coughs> Sophie Sarah, uh, hand over back to you so you can invite Dr. Poe uh, and Africa Rosa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sobe, uh, <clears throat> for that prelogue and in depth uh, finding. We now go to uh, Dr. Paul Boy. For those that are joining us online uh, through various streams, uh, Dr. Boy is a, a gynecologist and obstetrician. She holds an MBCHB from the Medical University of South Africa, also known as Medunsa, and she consulted uh, deeply with um, the, the women who are talking about the mother of babies and will hereby give a, a report. Uh, also bear in mind, members of the press, that she, under the medical code, may not reveal some of the questions we might want to ask uh, as deeply as we, we will, but we hope that some of the details covered in her consultation uh, she may share with us. Uh, after that, we'll give to Advocate Vernon, and then we will open the, the house for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. O over to you, uh, Dr. Boy. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. This is truly a sad moment for us as women in this country. Not only as a woman, but also as a parent, as a mother, as a doctor who's working with women. This is something that should not occur or happen to any woman in the country. Despite being rich, wealthy, poor, or whatever, despite being educated or illiterate, I, Dr. Mpokowe, I was consulted about the case whereby most of us have seen the case on the media. And most of us, including the journalists and everyone, criticized her, called her names, labeled her a liar. We even put pictures of her with washing basket in her tummy, saying she pretended to be sick, she pretended to be preg uh, pregnant. That's very painful as a woman. It's very, very painful. It leads to somebody, you know, literally to go mad. It's, it's something that should never happen to anyone. But let's go to the matter. Um, I consulted with uh, Ms. Uh, Sichuale, who's a para-16 gravida for. Gravida simply means the number of pregnancies that she had. She has been pregnant four times. Parity means being a parent. She had 16 kids. This is a woman who's been blessed with multiple pregnancies. This is a woman we'll call, we'll be referring to super ovulator or hyper ovulator. She had history of twins. She has history of triplets, a single baby, and ultimately the triplets. In the whole history, when you take the history, that's what we call the history in medi medicine, meaning the story. You come there, you consult, you tell me your story. I'll ask questions, that's the history, the medical history that I want. And you'd want to look at the patient, how the patient is dressed, how the patient reacts, acts in front of you. Is there any eye contact? Are you getting the truth from the story? And you'll dig deeper and deeper. On the first time when I saw her, she was dressed appropriately. It's very important to note that why the dress code? Do you follow through when we, we, we continue? There was good eye contact. 
with her. I got the history from Jiyahi. And when you'd inquire about your pregnancy history, most women will know that would want to know about your last normal menstrual period or your last menstrual period. And will calculate the gestational age of the pregnancy from that day of the last menstrual period to the time of delivery. That will actually give us the estimated date of delivery, which we re usually refer as the EDD. With Mrs. Toller's date, they tallied the sequence of the events when she was diagnosed pregnant, when she did her sauna, when she delivered. Everything tallied. She gave the history when she was diagnosed with multiple pregnancy, when she went to Sunning Hill um, Hospital. She was about seven weeks, then in January the 14th. And later, still at, uh, during that uh, visitation at Sunny Hill Clinic, she was told that the two babies were sitting in a wrong position. They were in the tubes. That would refer as an ectopic pregnancy. That would refer as an emergency. That would want to go take out, uh, repair that ectopic pregnancy because the patient or the woman might lead to death. But she was taken to Sunning Hill, admitted on the 18th. She was told that they are going to take the babies from the tube and be taken back into the womb. Medically impossible. You can go through under Google and he'll tell you that's not possible. That was the first incident that she was getting a rod in. And the following day, discharge sent home that all went well. All the babies, eight babies, that are inside the womb, everything is fine. And on giving her history about the multiple pregnancy, then we have to classify her as a high-risk pregnancy. Singleton pregnancy, it's a normal pregnancy. It could be low risk, it could be moderate, depending on other factors, hypertension, diabetes, and all that. But multiple pregnancy, it's a high-risk pregnancy. Worst of all, this was not only twin pregnancy. So her consultations, her medical care, antenatal care, will differ from a normal pregnancy. She has to be attended by a specialist who knows and who studied well, or who has interest in multiple pregnancy. <coughs> Certain procedures, certain things, ethics have to be followed in the whole procedure. In academic institutions, there are departments in the Department of Obstetrics. There will be multiple pregnancy. There will be medical department for hypertension, diabetes, cardiac. There will be pregnancy for those who have been losing pregnancies, bad obstetric history, and so on and so on. She was being attended at high-risk clinic of multiple pregnancy in Steve Biko. But while she was going to Steve Biko, Typical like any woman who's not that educated, even some educated women, will be attending at the clinic, attending at the, gyne uh, at the gynecologist, attending at an academic hospital. So she was attending at three places, a Sangwani clinic, Steve Pico hospital, and the, the private doctor where she was being attended to. With all those dates, when we follow them up, they correlated, the dates were documented on the books, on the hospital books, but what happened to that, it's something else. Further assessing her, when I was examining her, she was orientated to time, place, and person, which will tell you something that, uh, who are you? My name is so-and-so, how old are you? I'm so what day, today, what age are you, you know? Where are you? Who's the person you are with? All that. It was logic. Her speech was coherent. She was answering directly and correctly what I would ask. If she didn't understand, she would ask better. I don't understand. Please simplify your question. Which everything went well according to that. She was mobile. The only thing noticed is that she was limping on the right leg. I'll explain why the limping as we go on. We checked the blood pressure, which we discovered that she has developed hypertension. 
which could be due to the multiple pregnancy. Multiple pregnancy, one of the risk factors, they tend to develop hypertension during pregnancy. It could be hypertension postpartum, post delivery due to all the stressors that she went to. And when we look at the records that we got, she was never hypertensive throughout her pregnancy. The hypertension only developed later during all the stresses that she was going through, all the media hypes and all the accusations that she was going through. The blood pressure that stated was 168, 108, which is quite high, which actually says you must start here on treatment there and there. And further inquiring, getting all the history, realized she has developed insomnia, which is something that we must expect from her. She's not sleeping, she's having all these stresses that's going on. Like I said, she's well kept, orientated to time, place, and person. Systematically, all things were fine except the blood pressure. Then we went to the abdomen where the scar was found. And now you have to classify and say, is this a new scar, a recent scar, or an old scar? If you say it's an old scar, you still have to substantiate why. If you say it's a current scar, you still have to substantiate why. Then we have the classification of scar. That legally has to be done, even in court, they still want that. You can classify it according to the surgeon, the plastic surgeons, the pathologist. Several factors that you look into, that's the dynamics of the whole thing. You want to look at the nature of the causative agent, being it a blade, a gun, or whatever. You want to look at the location of the scar. You want to look at the treatment of the scar. Impeding factors of healing of the scar, which would be infections, other disorders like diabetes, cancers, and all that. Intrinsic genetic variation, that's very important. This talks about the rapid, healing, the rapid healing of the scar or the delay in healing of the scar. And post looking at all these factors, then you have to say, is this a recent scar? And how old is it? And how long does it take to heal? The plastic surgeons will tell you it can take two years to heal for proper healing. The dermatologist will say about six months to heal, and the pathologist will say about a year to heal. But then you have to touch and feel if this is quite recent because it can heal very well on top, depending on a genetic variation. But when you actually start palpating and feeling inside, then you realize this is a recent scar. The ridges are not smooth under there. There's still some bumping and all that. All, all of you have gone through uh, operations or cesarean sections or abdominal uh, operations. You know how it feels. And by doing that, investigating that, and I found that at the left-hand side, there was a sinus. That sinus simply says she did, some, she did have some infection, but which was not severe, which would ooze brownish fluid which she confirmed, yes, that was what happened. But that sign has healed well too. And then post all the findings, then it was deduced that the scar was less than six months old. And when I assessed her limbs, her lower limbs, the right lower limb actually is weaker than the left lower limb. That could be due to pressure of the raising abdomen, the big abdomen, on the great femoral vessels, which is very common with multiple pregnancies. Yes, with some women who are pregnant based on the hormones, the relaxing hormone and the progesterone hormones, they tend to relax all your muscles, all your structures, and that's why you see most of the pregnant women working like that. And, but at this stage, it's not a normal phenomenon. It's an abnormal, normal phenomenon. We say multiple pregnancy, it's normal but abnormal in the same place. The normal is having singleton. Abnormal in the sense that the uterus, the womb, can be able to carry until a certain amount. But this one was overloaded. And being overloaded, when you look at the anatomy, the womb literally sits on top of great vessels. 
It sits on top of great uh, nerves. And one of those nerves which will be affected, it will be the femoral and the sciatica. Reason that now, because of the prolonged pressure on those nerves, they actually got damaged, stretched, inflamed, and all that. Reason when she walks, she walks like a drop leg, like she was injured on that. Healing might take time. She might heal, she might not heal at all. So on conclusion was that she was definitely pregnant. She delivered by Caesar. And more than that, we cannot say it never happened. The delivery did happen. The delivery did okay. And further than because I am the second opinion or the third opinion, correctly I would have to want previous records, medical records, from the previous doctor who was attending to her or the previous hospital, which became tedious in the whole process, which became life risking. It was quite hectic where at some stage I had to change cars and use friends' cars or uh, you know, get some hired cars or all that to get all those files, to get all that information. Yes, we did ultimately get with the help, the legal help, the legal system that we managed to get all the information. And what happened with the first delivery, second delivery, and up till now, where she delivered the first babies, the triplets were delivered as Steve Pico, meaning that Steve Pico knows that. And the twins, where they were delivered at a, a private hospital. So we, we, we have that history. We even went to an extent that we had to look at the history of her psychosis, psychiatric illness, because on the gynae side, obstetric side, we want to classify uh, as a postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis. Does she qualify for that? Yes, she qualifies because there are women, a certain percentage of women who will have postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis which medical intervention has to take over. Otherwise, they'll end up killing their babies if they're not treated. But in this instance, you want to differentiate, is it postpartum or is it induced by the factors at hand at that present that she does not know where the babies are? Interesting, the findings were that the person who recommended her admission was a social worker. It does happen if she has all the history. But there are certain forms that have to be filled in the process that she should be admitted. There's form four, form number four, that was filled by the social worker, not the family, without any other collateral history. She was the one who had the collateral history, who was giving collateral history, that she's suicidal, she even has the method how she's going to kill herself. And before admission, there are supposed to be two form fives that are supposed to be filled by medical doctors. For them to be able to admit this patient, to assess this patient, to investigate what's the cause of delusions, hallucinations, psychosis, depression, and all that. And from there, they will take it step by step. But there was only form four in the records, form one and form six. Form one, it's for admission for 72 hours observation. And then form six, it's when they'll be transferring you to another institution. But at this stage, there's something strange in the whole thing. And all the basis on her being delusional was that she keeps on asking, where are my babies? And it, just because of that question, everyone said she's delusional which is said that no one even dig deeper, no one went to the records and went to SM when she gave all the history where she started her clinic and who she was attended by up to Steve Pico, but no one went as further as that to investigate that. But she was labeled and started on treatment. Yes, blood results were taken to investigate if it's not organic, meaning if she does not have thyroid problems, she does not have uh, cardiac problems. She does not have drug issues that uh, might have caused these delusions, uh, this psychosis at that stage. 
This was very interesting when we found the blood results because with a public sector, we know we use the National Health Laboratory System, the NHLS. <coughs> Every patient we take blood or specimens or swabs sent into the lab. That forms, we fill in your whole data, your name, ID number, your hospital number, and everything, you're female, you're male, it's all there. And then we put per sticker on pair bottles, specimen bottle. And one of the stickers has to go on your file. So that when we retrieve the results, we can actually use the reference number on the sticker to retrieve your results. The first four numbers, the four, first four reference numbers, when we entered them on the system, even if you have taken blood here in Cape Town, Jobek, it will still give us your history wherever you are. Where, whichever government hospital or public sector you have rotated, it will give us your data. Despite the years or anything, it will still give us the data. We entered those numbers, which the serial number ends with NOF, almost all of them. Um, <laughs> these numbers, interestingly, when you enter those serial numbers, every 20 minutes it was giving us a different name. I called the nurses I'm working with that, please come help me. Maybe read these alphabets and numbers for me properly. She did that. We called one of the clerks who helped us. Everyone was surprised what's happening. Then it reflected that this is a system that they are having IT people who are sitting there checking all these things every minute. It's either they're hacked into the government system or these are employees of the government. Yes, we have seen a few months back when we found one of the employees of NHLS who was fraudulently making COVID results and selling them. And you actually ask yourself, how bad is this situation? From the six stickers, we only got one, which actually showed us her results, her status. And when you look at the file, they did write the results on the side from, by hand, from the very same previous stickers. But when you log in, you don't find them. You log into the system to look for the file number according to a date of birth, her age, her ID number, and all that. She does not exist. She does not exist on the government system. We found that they were using several IDs for her. But even using those IDs for her, they don't exist on the system. Even if I can put my name as Mpopawe on the system, it's supposed to show me 20 Mpopawe's in South Africa and will eliminate them by date of birth. <coughs> she does not exist on the system. And this is the person that we're having file numbers, we're having copies of the files, that she has attended at the clinic, she has been seen at the hospital, she has been seen at several hospitals. Is she a ghost? What happened to her system, to her information? You look at the paramedic system, the invoices of transporting her and trying to get the information does not exist. And in the whole thing, we actually say, this is a woman who claims that she has delivered, which I would say she has delivered. This is the woman who can identify clearly and pinpoint where she was admitted, which ward, which bed, and we still come back and say she's hallucinating. And what have we done as doctors? We are bound by our oath. We are bound by the health ethics. We are supposed to be adjudicating and advocating for the patient. We are supposed to be saving lives. We are supposed to be happy when life is saved and when life is brought to life. We are supposed to be rejoicing when we see a woman having 10 babies. 
we're supposed to be supporting her, organizing to get her clothes if she's poor or get all those things. But what have we done to this woman? We have destroyed her. Intentionally and because of greed. We have incarcerated her to the psychiatric institution. Labeled her with all the doctors who have taken their own who said they love this profession, they're compassionate and passionate about this profession. But we found that these are the people who are destroying lives, who are destroying many of our sisters, our brothers, our aunts, and all. I would want to leave the legal part to the legal experts, but all I could say that uh, we have given her a rod deal. We have deceived the nation. We have destroyed many lives. We have seen many women coming to the forefront in the newspapers saying, my child died at the hospital, but I was never allowed to see my baby. I never said the last goodbyes to my child. I was told I'm expecting twins, but I only went home with one twin. And everyone says I'm mad. I don't know where's the child. And I keep on hearing my child crying at night. And we refer that mother to psychologist or psychiatrist. How many have you destroyed? How many lives have you destroyed? How many children have you separated from their families? As an African mother, there are so many beliefs that some people will be told that your child is crying somewhere else, go look for a child. Your ancestor said you have lost your child or you have given away your child. Where are you going to start with all those frustrations? You can't have more babies at this time, but you are told that there's this situation that you have to sort it out. Ndiyekhi Sitole deserved justice. She deserved to be told where are her children. She deserved to be given her babies, even if she did receive that money. But she has the right to be the mother. That child, those children have the right to a family, to a stable family, to be loved by their parents, to know their siblings. Thank you. On that very emotional note, we want to uh, invite Advocate Donen to, to take over. Uh, Advocate Donen, as you know, is a human rights, has been a human rights anti-activist, uh, anti-apartheid activist, and uh, he compiled the report uh, thus follows is this report. Uh, Advocate Donen. Thank you very much. This, uh, these are two hard acts to follow for a, for a mere lawyer. I'm a senior counsel based in Cape Town, and during July I was briefed by the attorney's firm Abrams Kiewitz to investigate the decuplets publication. I was asked to investigate, make findings, make recommendations and report to them, which I did on the 13th of August, more than two months ago, and while Mr. Sitoli was still detained at the West Corpus Psychiatric Hospital. Perhaps just so that you are aware of the limits of my uh, mandate, I should just sum up the terms of reference. Firstly, I had to investigate the veracity of the sources regarding the birth of the decupits, as reported in the Pretoria News, and to determine whether or not the births actually occurred. To consider, to investigate the due diligence undertaken by Mr. Rampedi, 
in preparing this article to investigate whether the requirements of independent media's press code were violated in the publications, to investigate any ethical breaches committed by independent media staff in reporting the story that other staff besides Mr. Rampetti, and then to consider other facts provided by the other, other publications in respect to the story which dispute Mr. Rampetti's story. In short, I made three findings. The first was that Mr. Tolley was prevalent. There were too many witnesses, family members, church members, community members, Mr. Rampedi, the photographer who photographed her, who, who had no doubt in their minds that she was pregnant, and she, it, it would have been impossible to mislead so many people, and there could never have been a, a collusion between all of them to somehow fabricate the fact that she was pregnant. So I had no doubt, it was certain, almost certain, that she was pregnant. The second finding was that there was no evidence at all at the time when I conducted my investigation that Ms. Sitoli had been pregnant or had given birth to decubits. And due to the fact that the birth of decubits is unknown in human history, I concluded that to publish a story saying that decuplets were born and the Guinness Book of uh, World Records was broken without any corroboration uh, was reckless. And the, the, the only evidence that existed at the time was a report that had been made by the father, the alleged father, Mr. Tsetsi, um, and he had said that it was his wife, Mr. Tully, had told him that she had given birth to decubits. So I regard that according to general journalistic standards as being reckless. And that would be so regardless of, of whether or not this present inquiry proves that in fact the, the babies were born. He, he would still have taken a risk, but the outcome would have been better for him than if it turned out to be more. No decubits born. So I, I saw this as a serious, as raising a question of journalistic ethics, which was serious. But as they pointed out, I, I'm a human rights lawyer, I have a, certainly a background in the old days of apartheid as a human rights lawyer. And for me, the real question was not whether 10 babies were born or whether 10 babies were not born. The real question for me, living in, 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 in South Africa, democratic South Africa, according to our values, was why on earth would the state go to such extreme lengths to detain Ms. Sitoli unlawfully in a psychiatric hospital? And the, the answer that I, the conclusion I came to, uh, and then I should tell you why in a second, was that at the time that the events took place, which, which, which Dr. Serva has described, uh, when, when she was arrested and detained in the psychiatric hospital, she had wanted to speak to her attorney, Rafaela McQuenna, and what they wanted to do was silence her. So it was clear she had a story to tell, and I'm, by hook or by crook, they were not going to let her tell it to her attorney or to the world at large through her attorney. And the basis for my conclusions do not come, there were, there were no right lives risked as, as for the other information that you've been told about. You simply have to look. There is a court case in Johannesburg where Ms. McQuenna applied for the release of Mr. Tony, and from those papers it is perfectly clear, firstly, that the arrest and detention were unlawful, and that there was something very, very curious going on. Because 
what had happened was that Mr. Tony was arrested by the police for being a missing person. Then she was taken to Krupp Krup police station and they held her there in a, in, a, in a motor vehicle until the social worker arrived, the, the staff from the Department of Social Welfare. Now those people say on oath that they did not believe that at the, clearly it can be inferred from what they say, but they did not believe there was anything wrong with her mental capacity at the time. Because they say her, their intention at the time was to take her to, to a, a shelter where she would be kept and, and looked after. And it was only when the attorney arrived and wanted her free and said you can't take her away that they requested her detention in a, in a psychiatric hospital. So the, the, the process, as, you, as you've been told, the state attorney was called in and they purported or, or pretended is probably a better word to detain her in terms of the Mental Health Act. And what the senior person, the regional director of social development, told the, 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 her bosses, the people who would actually uh, assist and facilitate the detention, was that this attorney was obstructing um, the social worker and the attorney would not consent to Ms. Satoli being taken in by social development and so they wanted her detained in the mental hospital. There was no suggestion there was something wrong with her. They were not getting their way. And she was not going with them and she was exercising her rights of the security of the, of the person in terms of her, of her rights and to have her attorney assist her in, in ensuring that. So what they did, is, as Dr. Survey told you, in contravention to Section 33 of, of the Mental Health Act, was the social worker put her into a a vehicle, another vehicle, took her to the hospital, Tenbiza, and filled in the forms which were required to be filled in in terms of the Mental Health Act. And therefore she facilitated, she the social worker who I will call Miss M.M., facilitated this detention. Now, what, what, what the Mental Health Act demands because, as you can imagine, it, it's a serious locking someone up in a, in a mental institution is a serious violation of their right of security of the person. What it demands is that if somebody does not consent to being locked up in the institution, and clearly there was no consent, she, uh, Ms. Sun, she totally even read out and signed a, a, a document saying, I do not consent to this. You, you, you are not misleading me, you are tricking me, and, and I, I'm, I'm not willing to do this. What, what the Mental Health Act requires under those circumstances is a member of the family. The Act says a spouse, a partner, that would have been her partner and the father of the, of the alleged deputates, Mr. Sortezzi, um, to come along and bring the application. And it is only if people the family members cannot be found and there is a good reason for it or they are unwilling to test it, to, to, to bring the application or unable to, to bring the application that a social worker can actually facilitate the detention. But she did so nevertheless and, and she did not explain why and it is quite apparent because Mr. Soltesi, the father, said in his affidavit there was nothing wrong with Mr. Tony Mentor. And so too, um, the, the um, documents which the social worker attached to the court papers indicated very clearly that if family members had been asked to, to bring this application, they would have said that there's nothing wrong with Mr. Tony. So that was, was, was completely irregular and unlawful. But then the next step they took, which, which you'll also see in the papers, is they said categorically 
that they had had Ms. Satoli examined by a doctor, and that doctor said she was not pregnant. She had never been pregnant. Now that screamed at me because you, you, you've seen the pictures and everything I heard looked like the pictures that previously appeared in, in the press. Pictures of, of a woman who was evidently pregnant. And then what struck me is that they, although they said the doctor said that she was, had never been pregnant, they didn't attach the doctor's report. And, they, and the explanation for this was they didn't attach the doctor's <coughs> report because if they had attached the doctor's report, then Mr. Tolley, the patient, would have seen it. And, if Mr. T and Mr. Tolley had no interest in the application for any attention. That, that's what she, they said in a high court in South Africa in this age on earth. And then finally, the, the, the last very curious aspect was I had been talking about um, a social worker, Ms. M.M., um, in my report, I use her name, her cool name, but as they have a story to tell, I, I won't use her name now. But Miss M.M., who physically facilitated the arrest and detention of Miss Atoli, took her to the hospital, filled out the forms, ducked around the, the legal requirements. That social worker, had been Ms. Sitoli's social worker in 2018 and 2017, when, when Ms. Sitoli, in, in the social worker's own words, was so heavily pregnant with triplets. She had been the social worker. And Ms. Sitoli had given birth to those triplets. There is no doubt about that. And those triplets disappeared off the face of the earth, never to be seen again. And there's still an, an investigation by the father, because the father of the triplets, who is not the present father, not, not Mr. Sotetsi, but another, another gentleman, he, he has, has gone to a lot of trouble to try and find his babies. He had been to Steve Biko Hospital. He had seen his babies when the triplets were now incubated in incubators. He had seen them over a period of eight weeks, and when he went there in the ninth week, they were gone. So he started a long process of looking for his children. So the difference between the, the decuplets and the, and, and the disappearing triplets is that someone actually saw the triplets in Steve Beaker. But when Mr. Was the father of, of the triplets approached Miss M.M., he said, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my, my children. Where are the, do you have any records of where I could find them? And her, her re reply to him was, there are no records at all of the birth of those triplets. And in fact, the investigation, the investigators uh, in this matter say that Steve Beaker has no record of the triplets. So you have, in the case of Mr. Tully, a very extraordinary situation. People are, have drawn all sorts of conclusions about what she said, uh, that she had decuplets, that they disappeared. They had drawn conclusions from the fact that they can't be found. They had drawn conclusions from the fact that there are no, no, no records of them in, in Steve Beaker Hospital. But the fact is, she's previously had triplets and there are no records of them either when they've also disappeared. So that, to me, as a human rights lawyer, that situation demands investigation in this day and age. I, I would expect if I, if I was de unlawfully detained that the press would, would investigate. But in this situation, there's a, compelling, there's a compelling need to investigate what exactly happened. So to come back now to my terms of reference, because I, I, I was limited yeah, as, as you have seen, I, I reached the conclusion, or I made a finding, that uh, Mr. Lampedi had violated the independent media code because he had published a story which was misleading, because he said decuplets had been born 
in, in the headline and in the first sentence of his article on the 8th, and he repeated this <coughs> right, when in fact all he had was, was a report by a farmer. And just to make the distinction, because, you know, royal, when royal babies are born, no one has to go and take a picture and have proof that there is, when the father makes the announcement, they believe. But when something like that has never <coughs> happened on a, in, in the history of the world, as far as we know, then there is a duty, as I understand the duties of a journalist, there is a duty to find corroborating evidence. And th that may now exist for all I know. So finally, I then made certain recommendations. Uh, one of them was to consider disciplining Mr. Rampeggy. Another was to add certain further provisions to the Independent Media Code of Conduct. Now, the one that exists there already was sufficient to, sufficiently contemplated as to Lampedi's error and, and to cover, and, 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 and to lead to the conclusion that, that he breached that provision of the code. But I have recommended a, an addition of a number of other provisions which would cater for any possible situation uh, in, in the future that might arise. So there could never be a, 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 con a confused event. It would prevent another confused event such as the present. And I've also recommended that those, the code of conduct with those clauses should be included in the employment contract of journalists. And then perhaps because Dr. Silva has referred to it. Um, my humble and limited role in precipitating the investigation, which they have done, and I, I should just read what exactly I said in the postscript to my report. I, 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 I said that as noted above, independent media's investigation travels well beyond the question of the birth or non birth of the deputies and indeed well beyond the remit of this inquiry. Quite apart from the question of whether Mr. Tolley was abducted and is being detained illegally, the hearsay evidence of witnesses suggests truly scandalous possibilities. These include the possibilities that Mr. Tolley was giving birth in order to have her baby sold with or without the cooperation of Mr. Tetsi, that such things may have occurred previously, that a syndicate dedicated to the kidnap and sale of babies operates out of Steve Beaker Academic Hospital, that a conspiracy exists between Dr. O, Professor M, and the social worker Ms. M. M, and that Ms. M. M arranged for Ms. Satoli's detention in order to cover up births that did take place for whatever reason, that the reason for Ms. Satoli's detention is to prevent her speaking about what happened to the babies. The remit of this commission does not allow it to determine the veracity of these possibilities. In any event, no determination could be made based on the information provided to the commission. In the event that independent media regards any or all of these probabilities as credible, their further investigation would seem to be of the greatest journalistic importance and to serve the public interest. In my view, taking into account the, the function of the press in society, which is also my report, to see that the truth about government activity gets to the public, so the public can decide who they want to govern and how they want them to govern in a democratic fashion, they, they, they seem to have been aiming at carrying out that function and perhaps I should leave it there. Thank you very much, Advocate Lenny. Um, we are going to start their colleagues with the, the live audience, which are yourselves. Uh, restrained questions, please, to what has been discussed. 
some of the utterances of the panel here, and then we will go to the online audience. We have a large virtual audience which is watching now on social media, uh, Google, Hangout, and Zoom, which have joined us. They will get an opportunity. Uh, in fact, they've sent those questions already. And then, uh, time permitting, we'll return to this audience if you want a second round of questions. Uh, I think we can do them in fours. Uh, with the raising of your hands, we'll take four questions uh, in that order. And you may ask your questions four at a go. Uh, panel, please jot down the questions as they ask to save time. Uh, then we may answer the questions one after the other. Uh, please begin by introducing yourself and the media house to which you represent, and then your question. We'll start with you, sir. Hi, Marvin from Sweet Four. I just want to find out, you know, despite this being a feel good story, why didn't Mr. Ampedi still do the basic journalistic skill and ask the five, the, uh, five W's and H in this term? And also, um, with regards to the hospitals, why wasn't all these hospitals mentioned in the story? And as well as the role of the editors, uh, before that story was published, why didn't the editors as well ask those five um, W's and those H's? Because they are also complicit in this. Okay. Well, there's no editor on the panel besides myself, so maybe I'll have to respond on that one. Yeah, but this, 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 this. Okay. Question two. Yes. I was wondering if I'm from the Cape Artists. Um, I, I just want to confirm that you will you be calling for a, a government inquiry into the whole matter. Um, second question is the integrity of the entire company is at stake. Um, so. Uh, you know, what certainty do we have that the whole truth will come out? Uh, and finally, um, how much did this investigation cost in the hiring of the, uh, the lawyer, the doctor, etc.? How much did it all cost the company? Yes. Hi, I am Ben Julie here. I'm the editor of the Daily News uh, in KwaZulu Natal. I just have a question for, for each. Um, of the panelists, and I'm going to start um, with Dr. Poole. Um, I'd just like to know, did the Departments of Health uh, and Steve Guido and the other doctors involved in your uh, investigation and in your assessments of this whole situation, uh, did they cooperate, cooperate with you uh, when you requested um, uh, medical records? And then also, Perhaps, uh, how is she doing? I mean, you've obviously interacted with her. You were doing, you know, your one-on-ones with her. You now more, know her more than than everybody in this room and the whole of South Africa. So, so how is she doing uh, psychologically? What is her state of health? Uh, what is her state of mind? And is she getting assistance uh, from this trauma uh, that she's been through? Um, and then uh, my other question is um, uh, for, for, for Advocate uh, Donan. Um, in your legal opinion, um, what do these findings um, tell us? Is there evidence of criminality? And in such, a, in such an instance of criminality, what is it that needs to happen going forward in order to ensure accountability? And then my last question uh, is for Dr. Sirvi. Um, as the owner of a media conglomerate such as independent media, how do you interpret the coordinated media attack that sort of dismiss the, 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 the decuplets uh, story as fake news, given the, the massive revelations that we've seen now? And also, what do you have to say I mean, about the insensitivity um, you know, uh, that is practiced by uh, uh, Nandos that we've seen, um, and also some other members of SANEF as well, who were very insens insensitive and who, I mean, who are complicit with this gross instance of, uh, of negligence and malpractice. 
So those are my questions uh, for, for the panel. Thank you. Hi, today, um, Robin Zanka, I am um, Ms. Um, Doctor, you mentioned that there was a Which possibility, Dr. Servant's life. You mentioned that there was a possibility of the mother implicating herself. You also made mention of the fact of money being exchanged. Was she paid any money? How much money was paid? Thank you. I think we can fit on one last question, sir. Yes, thank you. I'm Tina, I'm a freelance uh, science journalist. My question is uh, I have a couple of questions actually, and I was kind of looking for Please, to please limit them to two questions. I'll try. Time mm -hmm. permitting, we'll. No, no, you will sure. Limit them to two questions. If yeah. time permits, we'll give you another opportunity. Thank you. Um, I was hoping to come here today to get the answer of the question of what actually happened to the babies, but since we are um, getting to the point where we blame the government here, um, I, was, I was wondering if, given the extensive investigation that you've done, um, is the is there any criminal cases that will be opening against those um, what they call medical doctors, nurses, hospital administrators, and other government officials? And then just uh, from the point of clarification, is there any any other existence of the virus uh, as proof, like genetic material that, that is still in existence since that should have been moved somewhere? Um, yeah, any of any of those um, any photographic material that you've seen anyone on the planet? Thank you. Uh, there's a microphone in the, in the center. So we'll start with. Uh, I think there was only one question directed at me. And that was the gentleman of the Daily News, in my legal opinion, what did the findings tell us? Now, my findings were, were limited. I, I, I told you what my remit was for my terms of reference. All of this that you heard today, I heard today for the first time, and I have no evidence at all, no facts from which to reach any conclusions. I've heard the conclusions raised today, so I can't really answer the question. I, I, in so far as the detention of, of Mr. Tully is concerned, that is a matter I've, I've expressed opinions, but I made it very clear in my report that it's not for me to make the decision. It's for me to, it's for the court to do so. It's just that there are such alarm bells ringing that the, the, the question that arose was what, what, what were they trying to cover up? For all I know, I, I, I might be wrong. They might produce doctor's reports which con conflict with what this doctor has told you today and say that she, she never was pregnant and she, she never had any babies. I don't know. So I, I can't really reach a conclusion to my Okay. Dr. Thorpe. Yeah. Um, what um, you wanted to know, it's one, it's um, her condition, physical and mental and psychological condition currently. Um, I would say, like I have highlighted, that she has developed medical conditions which are chronic hypertension. She is currently her psychological state. Uh, she's not in a good state. She's trying hard to see the good things that she's got support from the partner. Um, the sign of her having insomnia that she can't sleep at night it tells you something that there's a, there's de a depressive effect that it's going on currently. She talks now and then, when she can cope, she calls that there's this situation. We advise her accordingly, but she's currently stable and doing well. And I think I'll go to the other question that what should happen to the doctors and the health workers implicated. With the doctors, there's health professional counsel, um, there's nursing counsel for the nurses, there's social workers counsel, which they have to be reported uh, there on those councils and their codes of conduct that binds uh, all of us. And beside that, this is not only a case for those councils, it's a criminal case. So suggestions and recommendations will be made according to the intensity of the case, which at this stage, they might be scrapped off the rock. The recommendation might be that must be scrapped off the rock. 
Dr. Sergei. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think the first the first point to make is that um, uh, Advocate Dolan, and thank you very much for Advocate Dolan's report, um, is that his report, uh, which was given to me on the 13th of August, and is mentioned in his postscript, asked us to look into uh, the possibility of, of baby trafficking. And um, Advocate Dolan is a human rights lawyer. And I took that very, very seriously and um, decided uh, to uh, invest significant resources into establishing whether or not we were dealing with um, human trafficking, baby trafficking. So Advocate Dolan's report was very important in that respect. Of course, it is limited because it was until a period of time, let's say the first to second week of August, and a lot has happened subsequent to that. Um, what has happened is my family foundation, Service Philanthropies, Service Family Foundation, has been involved in anti-trafficking programs for the last 20 years. And we have been one of the key funders of the World's Children's Prize for the Rights of Children. And uh, one of the key projects of the WCPRC is in fact in anti-trafficking. So the Family Foundation committed substantial resources to help independent media with this investigation. And I can tell you that cost in the region of two million rand. That was the commitment from the Family Foundation. We, we have actively worked against the trafficking of young girls and women in Asia and Africa in particular, recently in South America. And, uh, you know, both my, my, my family, my family members are very involved in such a program as a key project of our foundation. So when Advocate Dolan's report came through to me and I discussed it with the Family Foundation, we agreed that we'd commit, firstly, um, substantial resources to getting to the bottom of this because um, I'll, I'll come back to another factor in a second. But also, we're going to commit further resources as our family foundation towards funding, um, towards funding anti-trafficking or getting to the bottom of trafficking, baby trafficking in particular, and trafficking of young girls in, in, in South Africa. Because we, you know, we were shocked ourselves, the extent of this. I, I was a little bit disappointed with Nando's because um, they made fun of this vulnerable black woman that had, um, that had uh, you know, been through this, ma this, this massive trauma. <coughs> Whilst it may seem funny to them or the advertising agency, um, I really think that Nando's owe her an apology, owe the nation an apology. They've recently been embroiled in the, this thing with um, this guy, I forgot his name. Yeah. What's his name? Yeah. 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 So, 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 you know, but I want to invite them. I know the Eindhovens, they, they're good people. I want to invite the Eindhoven family, that the owners of Nando's, to join us as Survey Philanthropies and the Survey Foundation to set up an anti-trafficking fund to assist lawyers, human rights activists, NGOs, to put an end to the trafficking of babies in our hospitals. Obviously, I'd like to join, ask others to join us as well. We as a family will commit to that foundation substantial amount of money, not only to help independent further in journalistically to get to the bottom of this, but to actually help stop the trafficking of young girls and babies in, 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 in South Africa. I am really, really shocked by that. One of the things that touched me personally, and I must tell you this, and you'll see the full video of him in the series, in the video series, which my family foundation is also supporting with Independent. It's of a young man, very sophisticated man, young man. I thought actually he was a lawyer, but he's, he's an analyst consultant. Completely broken and devastated by what has happened to him. 
in July 2019, he, he went to Steve Beaker Academic Hospital for a period of eight weeks to visit his babies. He recognized these babies because they had the same birthmark as him. This will be in one of the seeds. He went there full of joy that these babies, he would, they were preterm, and he would be able to fetch them once they had reached you know, maturity term. When he arrived at the hospital with two cars, on one Friday with lots of gifts for the babies, and, and he had bought you know, cots and food and all sorts of things. The nurse, the matron, told him that the babies had left with the mother to Soweto. He endured massive trauma trying to find his babies for the next uh, year. Used all of his money, left his job to focus full time on trying to find his babies from Steve Beaker Academic Hospital that he had visited them four times in the ICU in the neonatal care unit. The thing that <coughs> struck me personally as a father was that he said those birthmarks on the babies were what attached him to those babies and that he remembered those birthmarks more than anything else. He spent a fortune with private investigators. He went to Steve Beaker, he went to the CEO, he went to everyone else. What he then discovered was that no file existed, Steve Beaker, of his children. No babies were registered at home affairs. If just for him, if we can find his babies, if, if we can prevent this from happening again, and that's why my family foundation committed these resources towards this, because his story, which you'll hear in the series, will, will send, uh, will, will really make you cry. It, it is just absolutely tragic. Up to this day, he still hopes, in some way or another, they'll find these three babies, the triplets. But Steve Biko has no evidence of any of this. The file doesn't exist. It's as if they never, it never happened, yet this father went for six to eight weeks, four times, to see and visit his babies in Steve Biko. So, so I think to, to an extent uh, that is what has forced us to, um, you know, the media have differences. We compete with each other. Sometimes it's political, sometimes it's about business. But on this matter, we should all work together. We should not compete with each other. We should not try and destroy each other. We should work together to end baby traffic. More importantly, we should work together to hold all of these people to account for that they come. Yes, we have many differences with other media houses. I guess we are different. We are the only truly transformed black media house in this country. It's a fact. Ninety-five percent of our grouping is fully transformed. And uh, in ownership, management structures, control structures. We speak to the fact where our people come from, which is the black community, the poor communities, the disadvantaged communities, those who suffer and hunger. So we tell a different story to the likes of other media houses who focus their media on the reach of the powerful and other standards. We make no apologies for that. That's who we are. That's who we remain. But doing that, of course, we, 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 we tend, to, tend to create problems for us. With regard to Mr. Abdelhaid, it was a feel good story. Cut him some slack. Cut him some slack. It was not an investigative story when it started. It was a feel good story. But let's also not pretend that Mr. Abdelhaid 
has not ruffled the feathers. Mr. Rampedi was critical in publishing the South Road Union story. He's critical in publishing other stories. He has ruffled the feathers of very powerful figures. And in fact, I can tell you, a very senior politician that's in government today, who's recently had a book written about him, called me one evening at my home and said to me, your appointment of Rampidi and Mzirikazi is a declaration of war. Your appointment of Rampidi is a declaration of war. And I was shocked by that because the person wasn't being appointed to It was the editor in chief. And secondly, I couldn't understand why a politician would be making such a demand. So, so Mr. Rampidi is not everyone's favorite person. Let's be frank about that. Did he make mistakes? Absolutely. He could have, he could have done this differently, even if it was a feel-good story. But remember, in defense of what has happened here, Mr. Rampedi did not know that behind all of this, the doctors involved was in fact the syndication. He did not know. And it's easy in hindsight to now say but we take very seriously the report of our press ombudsman and very seriously the report of Advocate Michael Dome. And the editor in chief is, has implemented all those necessary safeguards going forward. Mr. Abidi himself has felt the, 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 the impact of that within the group. To his colleagues, he personally wrote an apology letter misconstrued by other subjects. The apology letter was not to say that what he had done was wrong, but that he could have done things better. I think we must be fair in life. People do make mistakes. Mr. Rampini could have done this better. Am I prepared to throw Mr. Rampini under the bus? Absolutely not. As I would not throw any of my other editors under the bus. I said, once an editor is appointed, they are supported 100% and the editor-in-chief. And we are with them to the future show. But there are lessons to be learned. And of course, uh, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of um, other editors of other media titles that make mistakes. But they are never, never, given the harsh treatment Mr. Rampedi has been given. I owe nothing to Mr. Rampedi, but what I do owe to him and to every other editor working in the independent media group is fairness justice and a sense of, uh, of treating people properly. And I do not apologize for that. And um, in the end, uh, Mr. Rampey will make the means, I'm sure, and he will improve things as well. Government more than inquired the president, the president himself, if he's serious about GDP, and I believe, and he should institute immediately an inquiry into the conduct of all of these people. But more than that, he should get them suspended immediately so they cannot interfere with the investigation. More than that, the government owes Mr. Tony an apology. More than that, the government must compensate Mr. Tony for the trauma that she has experienced. We can't tell Mr. Tony what she can or cannot do. In fact, the irony of everything, one of the ways in which the Department of Health has managed to get Mr. Tony silenced is that she herself cannot speak about this. Because if she dare speak anything about it, they'll take her back to the psychiatric institution. That has been a condition of the release. Now, I hope the whole country stands up. Maybe I should ask Julius Malema to stand up. Take thousands of people to West Coppings if they dare detain Mr. Tony again. It is time that we hold account for all of these people. They cannot just do what they want to do. This country has a constitution and it has regulations. So, in terms of the coordinated media attack, well, we've gotten used to that. Look, independent media is mainstream, but it's not mainstream. We are different. 
we don't blow the horns of powerful politicians in order to get advertised, in order to get support, in order to get funded. We are not, we say what's good and we say what's bad. That means that there will always be a target, and we will always be a target of their proxies. You simply have to look at who funds online publications, who funds certain political parties and certain individuals. If I may use a famous sort of saying, connect the dots, by looking at the funders, you'll see the agenda. It's very really simple. We did not come out of a poverty. We were not a media house that was born and bred under poverty. So absolutely, we stand for our people. And there are always going to be attacks against the independent media. Always. Because people are afraid of the truth. They're afraid of our perspective. They lie about us, they distort us. But you know what? We have 1,600 people committed to this business, committed to our, to our organization, that believe in our mission of telling the story of the poor and the vulnerable. Insofar as the mother receiving money, I'm not going to answer that question because I think we should wait for the video series. However, I want to make the point which I've made repeat. The mother is a Poor black woman. You know, if you're poor, you have no food, you have nothing, and someone puts a cavity in front of you, no matter if it's a rotten cavity, you're going to take it. That's what I want to tell you. Because there's so much poverty, and we saw it during the July unrest. It's not these so called people on Twitter that instigated that. That's absolute rubbish. That's deflection from the reality. In fact, that's an attack on media feed. The right of ordinary people to treat what they want to do. People rose up because they are so poor, because they wanted food, they wanted the basic necessities. Poverty is rampant in our country. Unemployment is rampant in our country. The way to address that is not to address people of social media, but to actually create jobs for the people in this country. I think that's what is important. Insofar as the the child, the child Care Act does not allow us to, to show you know, the, the, the existence of the babies. But watch the series. I hope I've answered all of the questions. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, our online audience is asking uh, some questions. Social media uh, is a buzz this afternoon. Uh, Belinda Petro from Times Live asks Dr. Howard, please confirm if there are medical records available for the delivery. This is to Dr. Boyd. Uh, Devil Hope Monama from News 24 is asking if Mr. Rampedi uh, will be disciplined as to uh, Mr. Gurnan's recommendations. I, I think uh, Dr. Survey has uh, touched on that. And the um, uh, sequel from, uh, from the star uh, is saying the star covered um, a protest of women outside a center where six girls were rescued in February is possibly coverage. But uh, media in SA did not run with that. So we've got three questions and a comment. I think it means that uh, there was an expose from a building in Joburg that we covered and six school girls were rescued. It was a human trafficking ring. Find that on IOL, but TV media and broadcast did not cover that story. So he's speaking to the interest in, in, in SA media for covering the real stories of gender based violence and human trafficking. Uh, so, Dr. Boyd, the first was to you. Um, about medical records, yes, there are medical records. President Lecture is pregnant. There are medical records available that the babies were born. Every child, when he's born, there will be a proof of uh, birth uh, registration or birth notification that you're supposed to take to home affairs with your IDs and all that so that you can register and get the birth certificate. So we've got proof of all that. Uh, News 24, of course, also covered that um, the father of the triplets did come out uh, previously asking where those children are. So, of course, that was evident to the fact that uh, the mother had triplets previously, um, and that's also out there online. 
uh, a final round of questions, call it one question each, is what to close. If there's none, uh, we'll conclude the business of today. Is there anything from this house? Uh, any closing remarks from uh, panelists? Just uh, we need to say thank you to Patrick and Dirk for his client. Thanks to Dr. Uh, Pope. And thank you to all the journalists and everyone else that's attended our conference. We really appreciate it. And uh, let's work together to get rid of baby trafficking in our country. Thank you. And of course, this is not the last session we're going to have on the story human and child trafficking. Uh, please expect our series, uh, not Netflix, our series. We're going to be uh, launching that. And we'll have uh, an update for you on how the story develops, who's been arrested, how big is the ring. Uh, we also call upon government. In fact, we appeal uh, to government to take this very seriously. We need a commission of inquiry. We appeal to the police commissioner or the minister of police uh, to, to, to intervene with an urgent investigation so they can really back us up. So thank you very much. The closing remarks yeah, go to sorry, I, I, I think I've taken more credit than I deserve for this investigation. I just want to repeat what is the postscript of my uh, report, uh, where I spoke of all these horrible possibilities. And I said, in the event that independent media regards any or all of these possibilities as credible, the further investigation would seek to be of the greatest journalist. So it is them, not me, who is responsible ultimately because they have regarded the system. Thank you for the credit. So, Doc, it's up to you to provide the resources to continue. <laughs> Some of yeah. Thank you very much, colleagues, uh, this house of parents. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.